الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد I begin in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except the one Allah and that his beloved Nabi and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and final messenger um, Alhamdulillah uh, for those of you that are here in person and then of course everyone that happens to be online um, it's an immense <coughs> pleasure, honor uh, to be amongst those who uh, get to be chosen to go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make Umrah and to visit the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina Munawwara. This is a, this is a very powerful trip and um, it, you know our lives are filled with a lot of uh, busyness, uh, dunya, world, importance in you know, what, how we dress, what we look like, what we drive, where we live, etc., etc., uh, the material. And uh, this trip uh, is all about the spiritual. It's all about Allah. It's all about His Messenger. It's all about the stories. It's all about the sacrifices. And um, most importantly, to be able to come back with that in our lives uh, and give... Um, greater importance to the spirituality versus the material world that we happen to be living in, of which there's, you know, a lot of people put great importance in. Uh, because that's, that's the reality around us, right? The glamour of the dunya, as the Qur'an calls it, right? It's, that's, and so uh, Umrah is highly, highly spiritual. One of the things that was mentioned is before you go, call everyone. Uh, make sure that you, especially family, especially people that we've um, had differences with, and, and call them, uh, ask for forgiveness, uh, seek their forgiveness, seek their blessings, seek their du'as, and ultimately, um, you know, make, make amends with individuals because um, A, they may not come back, which would be the most awesome deal in the world, uh, and B, um, when we come back, we want to come back clean. We want to come back clean. We want to come back uh, rejuvenated. We want to come back with that spiritual energy, inshallah. Uh, again, I'll mention this really quickly for the people that might have, again, just joined at 11 o'clock. Uh, one of the most important things that was mentioned was the NUSUK app, N-U-S-U-K. Uh, please make sure that you download it. You will need your visa. You will need your passport number. You will need your visa number in order for you to register for the actual app. Uh, I just say this as a matter of fact. I just got back a little over a week ago. You do not need a permit for an Umrah. You do need a permit to get inside the Rolda. I'll cover some logistics around that in a little while, um, but. Uh, the appoint actually, the appointments are open for the entire month of January at this point for the brothers, which is really awesome because in December, the appointments opened up like two days in advance. So I, I might have checked 100, 200 times before we managed to get some appointments. It's actually open until February 4th. Uh, yes, the day you, you're arriving from what I understand or somewhere around there. So in any case, uh, if you give it a day or two, it may actually, or, or a week or so, it may open up more. Uh, I would suggest this, Pervez Bhai, specifically for the group, is if all of you can designate one time and a message goes out when you're making the booking, say, let's all go at this time uh, so everyone can go at the same time versus go individually. It'll make the time uh, go by a little easier because there is a decent amount of waiting to be done, again, depending on what time and when you get there. Um, they have, uh, they, when you do the bookings, it shows green, orange, and red, depending on the amount of people that are signing up. Honestly, it makes no difference. You could get there an hour before your appointment. You're still going to get in. You could get there about a half an hour after. You're still going to get in. But they will check the day, and they will check the time. And as Pervez Bhai mentioned, they will make sure that the app is actually flashing. So a screenshot is not going to uh, work. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay. Umrah. <clears throat> what is Umrah? Umrah is the lesser pilgrimage. It's the pilgrimage that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to express uh, our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to 
ensure that we fulfill the right of the, the Baytullah, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can be done 24 hours a day. It can be done 365 days a year. Uh, it's it's makruh within certain days of hajj. Uh, but other than that, the umrah can be done year round at any given time. It is an act of ibadah. It is an act of worship. But at the same time, it's uh, sometimes within the moment, uh, you're, we're so caught up with the logistics of doing everything that the, we may not feel the sacredness of that tawaf or the sa'i sinking in within that moment, but it's definitely entering into our hearts and into our souls because we are within an act of ibadah and worship. <clears throat> Before I get started with the slides, and I will in a minute, um, many people will have moments of reflection at different moments within their journey. It may be um, earlier on in the journey, it may be halfway through your journey, it may be towards the tail end of your journey. It may actually even happen when you're on your flight back and you can't fall asleep on the plane, you're wide awake, you have nothing to do, and you're just reflecting. And uh, everyone has a reflection of some sort. Everyone has a reflection of some sort. Um, I have to be honest, um, my greatest reflection uh, last week was, was, um, it was just surreal seeing the amount of people there, you know, struggling with money, struggling with time, struggling with all kinds of things in order to be able to get there, right? People are taking time off from work. People are making payments. There's all kinds of struggles that we make to get there. And my greatest, you know, sort of moment was that God is real. Allah is real. And Islam is real. There's no doubt about it. Just, that's it. Allah is, Allah, because we're, we live in a very atheistic society. People don't want to talk about God. If you talk about God, it's not awesome, right? It's a blue state. And so we're reading, we're, we're, you know, we're absorbing all of that. It may or may not make a difference, but at the end, you know, it's there. You know, it's, on, it's on your mind, it's in your heart. But just for me, it was just sitting in front of the Kaaba one fine night and just seeing the people make the law. I was just sitting there. And, I just, and the Kaaba being so majestic and so high. And everyone in white, for the most part, in the mataf, that Allah is real. He exists. And Islam is real. And I'm just humbled and grateful to be a part of this group of individuals. And I pray to Allah that me and my progeny remain on this until the final day. And that if that means, I mean, and if that means that challenges are going to come my way or our way as a community, then there's no one greater than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who faced challenges. People, I, the biggest question that many people have is, what du'as do I need to learn for Hajj and Umrah specifically? And the answer is none. None. The only one that is prescribed at one point or at two points during the tawaf is Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab That's it. But as we're making the tawaf specifically, and as we're making the sa'i, to constantly be engaged in some form of dhikr is not a requirement, but it's crucial in order to make our tawaf and our sa'i meaningful. Right? Meaningful. Otherwise, you can literally be in FaceTiming while you're making tawaf. And your tawaf is still valid. It's just not going to get you the same amount of spirituality. So find some form of dhikr. A lot of times people ask me and say, what should I do? What should I do? Or, you know, what should I get? I'll actually share the, the uh, Pervis, but if you can remind me and I'll actually remind myself, there's a set of small booklets called how to perform. We, you know, you've seen these. how to perform Hajj, how to perform Umrah and how to perform Ziyarah. These are three small booklets. 
I'll send you the PDF so you can share it with the group and people can download it to their phones. Um, Parvez Bhai mentioned, uh, reminded us a little while ago that when in Medina we should be making salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'll come to this at the tail end, but set a goal for yourself that every day while I'm there, I'm going to send a hundred salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, five hundred salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and after or before every namaz, after before every prayer. Pull out your prayer bead, whatever it is that you're using to count, and send salutations on the Prophet ﷺ. They can be any salutations. The salutations that we recite in Salah, Durud Ibrahimi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, or any other salawat for that matter. And if you can't, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in and of itself is salawat on the Prophet ﷺ. But there's a number of salawat compiled through the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu there's a book called Salat and Salam that I, you don't have to buy this, I generally recommend it for those people who want to have it. This is not just for your journey to Medina, this is even for here on Fridays and on Mubarak days, we pull it out and send Salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the, the, the book that I use, that's, my book is completely coming apart at this point, is Accepted Whispers. It's my absolutely favorite book of du'as. Almost every du'a of the Qur'an and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ found in all the hadith traditions are compiled in this one book. The Arabic, English transliteration for people who can't read Arabic fluently, the English translation as well for those of you who may not be able to read Arabic but at least go through the English. Right? There, there isn't, as our teachers would remind us, there's not a thing in the world that, that we need in our lives, in this life and the hereafter, that the Prophet ﷺ hasn't already asked for. And so what good, you know, what better thing to find a place where we can find all of those things and just go through them, right? Read through them. You, will, you can use this during your tawaf, you can use this during your sa'i, you can use this on the plane, you can use this as you're sitting in front of the Kaaba in the Haram, you can use this while you're sitting in Medina and so on and so forth. Extremely powerful book. I would urge all of you to uh, get a copy. Okay, moving on. What should you have? I know Pervez Bhai covered a few things. Uh, you, you won't need any Haram from here, so don't take one, don't put it in your bag. You're all going to, for those of you that are going to Medina first, sorry. You know, you can get your ihrams there. A seven bead tasbih uh, just makes easier for you to count how to, you know, how many tawafs you've done. Um, a small bag, I'm going to go through this really quickly. A small bag, you know, just a PE bag. You know, y'all know what a PE bag is with shoulder straps. Uh, so you can throw your uh, prayer rugs or your shoes or sandals inside there and just carry it on your back if it makes it easier. Uh, slippers, um, brothers and sisters, uh, sisters. While we are in the state of ihram, that's coming up on the next slide. While we are in the state of ihram, sisters, you have absolutely no requirements whatsoever on what you have to wear. You can wear what you want, anything, any color, no requirements at all. Brothers, we have certain requirements. Amongst those requirements is that we have footwear in which this top part of the foot is exposed. So, uh, you know, flip-flop flip-flop type of sandals that you will want to wear specifically during ihram. Get something just, you know, something a little nice because you'll be wearing it for a few moments. A waist pouch for those of you that may want one to carry. When you are in ihram, brothers, we don't have any pockets. So where do you store your phone? Where do you store your glasses when you're making wudu? Where do you store your wallet? A pouch is a good place to have that. Uh, an ihram belt. By the way, in terms of a belt for your ihram, you can use any belt. The belt you're wearing right now that has a ton of stitching on it can be used for your ihram as well. You don't have to buy specifically an ihram belt. Some people do. That's fine. Um, Medina is cold. You met Pervez by mentioned this. Medina Munawara is cold. Take, take a decent jacket. Uh, take a beanie. Take some socks. Uh, because you will be utilizing those. Something someone recently taught me 
If you have any extra sweaters or any extra jackets, throw them in your luggage, take them with you. Every morning when you go to the haram, take one or two with you, find someone who doesn't have a jacket, find someone who has a chadar on them, just a sheet on them and doesn't have a jacket, give it to them. Okay, so just something someone taught me very recently. If you wear glasses, extra prescription glasses, medications, yada, yada, yada. Sisters, you want to take a scissor. There's no barbers for sisters. You will have to be cutting each other's hair upon the completion of your umrah. So make sure you carry scissors with you. Uh, your, again, if you have a Quran that you normally use, please make sure that you carry that with you. Uh, a little distorted there. You know, Sharpie. Um, n- who uses notebooks these days? No one uses notebooks. The notes section in your phone is what everyone uses. Uh, these are just things that will make your life a little easier and make you cool if you have it. Um, a portable weighing scale in case you plan to do shopping and bring stuff back and make sure that your cell phones are, are working when you're there. Okay, moving on. Before you go on any journey, pray two rak'ahs and make dua. This is not just journey of Umrah or journey of Hajj. You're getting on a journey to drive to LA. You're getting on a journey to go to Chicago. You're getting on a journey to you know, fly to... Uh, you know, fly abroad, wherever it is. Any journey that you go on, pray to Allah, guys. But by the way, we'll share these slides with you so you don't have to take pictures. Uh, also, um, give some sadaqah. Any, the way to make your journey easy is just by being generous on your journey. Just give sadaqah. It just, it, sadaqah wards off difficulty. Sadaqah wards off, you know, evil. If there's something to come in your path, you've given sadaqah, Allah will take care of you, things will open up. So learn to give sadaqah. Learn to be generous. Right? Don't always be looking to save money, as some people do. You know, There's some people who uh, like to bargain. If I, now again, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but a few years ago, I was in Umrah with my father, and he said, Bitta, from here onwards, don't ever bargain in Makkah and Medina. I've never bargained from that day onwards. Now that could be very difficult, because Saudi markets are like Pakistan markets. Right? So... If this is 50 rials, they're going to tell you 100. Okay, so you have to have the heart at that point. But that's your personal decision. Um, You're supporting, I'm not saying don't bargain, but don't always be looking for a deal. You're helping out a Muslim economy. You're helping out a Muslim. A few extra dollars, you know, if in your entire journey you spend a few extra dollars, fifty, a hundred dollars extra, it's not going to be the end of the world for you. But it could mean so much for the person that you are, you know, you're there with. So, khair, in, a, in, in any case, I need, to, I need to move on. Okay, Mecca or Medina, depend, you're, m- most of the group, in this case, is going to Medina first. Medina first, no requirements. You'll be flying into Medina. The moment you board, you know, from here, as you board your plane, salawat on the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Be ready for that journey. Spiritual preparation for that journey, you know, to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's so much I can say, but I won't. But we are meeting uh, the best creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Khayru khalqillah. Right? We are meeting the Sayyid. Right? Sayyidul Anbiya, the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when we get there, and when we give him our salam, he will return his salam back to us, inshallah. And so we want this moment to be special, which we also want that from here onwards, from today onwards, in preparation for this journey, start fulfilling all the sunnahs of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can't claim to love the Prophet and not fulfill his sunnah. You can't claim to love the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam and say it's just a sunnah. You can't claim to love the Prophet and say, I'm going to you know, change when I get there. It doesn't work that way. Right? We have to sh- make that intention and action before we get there. For Makkah Mukarramah, for anyone that may be going to Makkah first, you have to be in the state of Ihram prior to your arrival at Jidda airport. So make sure that you're putting on your Ihram at the airport before, you know, whichever airport it is if prior to flying into uh, Jidda, putting on an uh, putting on an ihram on the airplane is not a good uh, you know not a good choice. Uh, if you are going to Mecca first, make sure that your ihram is in your handbag and not in your uh, checked in luggage because you'll need it you'll need it to put on the ihram. Um, 
Yeah, and, and you have to be in this. Yes, you have to be in the state of Ihram prior to your arrival at Jeddah airport. You can't say, I'm going to get to Jeddah and then put on my Ihram. You cannot say that I'm going to get to Makkah and then go to Masjid Aisha and then put on my Ihram and come back. It doesn't work that way. You have to be in the state of Ihram prior to your arrival at Jeddah airport for those individuals who have intention to go to Makkah upon their arrival at Jeddah airport. So please do not uh, forget that. Okay, uh, I, I'll skip this slide. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has designated certain areas. These are known as Miqat. That prior to your entering into these areas, you have to be in the state of Ihram. Uh, for those of you, for those of us that are uh, going from Medina, who are arriving into Medina first, and then going, um, Dhul Hulayfa, which is the first one, Bir Ali, happens to be the Miqat. Now, historically, people would get in their taxis or buses, go to Bir Ali, there's a big masjid there, they would take a shower, put on their Ihram, pray their two rak'ahs, make the intention, say labbaik, and then continue their journey to Makkah. It doesn't happen like that anymore. You're on a bus, you're on a train, right? So you put on your ihram in your hotels in Medina. You pray your two rak'ahs in the haram or in your hotel. And if you want, you can go ahead and make the intention and say labbaik. And then get in the taxi, get in the bus, and it just carries on. And at some point, you enter into the haram boundary from there onwards. Now, Prophet, stop me in case you remember anything. Please remind me. I, yeah, please. Okay, brothers, simply by wearing two pieces of white cloth, nothing happens. I could wear two pieces of white cloth and walk around in Pleasanton. People will just think I'm an angel. I'm an embodiment of Jesus and nothing really happens, okay? I'm just, when you put on the ihram and you make the intention and say labbaik, then you have entered into the state of ihram. I say this because you could potentially put on your ihram, ihram clothing or sisters, you can just be in your regular clothes at Istanbul airport, but you don't necessarily enter into ihram until you make the intention and you may wait for two hours before you actually make the intention. Make sense to you? Right? Because you don't, wanna, you don't want the restrictions of ihram to come unto you. Right? And the restrictions of ihram are no scent, no perfume, after using the bathroom, being mindful that you don't use the soap, the scented soap, right? The most common mistake that people make. Um, you can't trim your nails, you can't cut your hair, and so on and so forth. The state of ihram, the state of ihram is a state of a faqir, is the state of a beggar in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So it's that you're coming in an extremely humbled, in a humble state, in humble clothing, as a beggar would, right? Begging, seeking, beseeching, supplicating to the master, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what ihram is about. And so keep that in mind. So again, uh, you know, wherever you're putting on your ihram, sisters, again, your regular clothes, whatever it is that you wear, just becomes your ihram as you may say that, uh, pray to. The two rak'ahs that you pray upon putting on the ihram is a sunnah, is not a requirement. You make the intention. The intention is not some dua in Arabic specifically. It's just an intention. Oh Allah, I intend to perform this umrah. Please make it easy for me and accept it from me. And then saying labbaik. At that moment, you have entered into the state of ihram and all the restrictions of ihram are now binding upon you. Questions at the end, please write them down. Uh, and then again, the talbiyah can, you know, generally, historically, the talbiyah was, the scholars would remind us, was never done in a group fashion, but if people do so, that's fine. But keep the talbiyah on your tongue. Basically, you're saying, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, I'm here, O oh Allah, I'm here, I'm present, O oh Allah, I'm present. Right? I'm, I'm coming to you, O oh Allah, I'm coming to your sacred house to perform this sacred ibadah, O oh Allah. That's what, that's what we've been taught by the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's entering into the state of ihram and making, uh, saying the talbiyah. Uh, yeah, again, I'm going to make this really quick. You know, brothers, it's two sheets. By the way, two sheets of white cloth, no undergarments. So no underwear, no t-shirts. It's just two sheets of white cloth. Sisters, once again, you can wear what you want, any color. 
whatever you want. Okay. Um, two sheets of white cloth, fold one over, fold it over, you put a belt, and then you just put the top on. It's as simple as that. Okay, very, very easy, very, very simple. Um, if you happen to be on the heavier side and you choose to stitch through your bottom piece of your ihram, it's actually makruh but allowed, right? So just for the record, right? Because if your ihram opens up and your aura gets revealed, and aura is not just your immediate private parts, anything above your knees, right, is your aura. If, if, you, if you fear that that may get exposed, that is haram. And so if you choose to stitch through uh, the bottom half, it's makruh, but it's, uh, but it's allowed. And I did say using any belt is permissible. I know that many of you are going to Medina first, but in this presentation, I've covered Medina at the very end. And so that's how we'll do it. We'll just go through this really, really quick. You'll get to your hotels, you'll check in, you'll eventually make your way to the Mataf, to the Kaaba, to make your Umrah. Um, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that when you see the Kaaba for the first time, whatever dua you make is an accepted dua. Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullahi Alayhi says that when you see the Kaaba for the first time, your dua should be, Oh Allah, whatever supplication, whatever dua I make after this dua, accept it from me. Whether it's the first time in your life, and it may be the first time in your life for many, and whether it's the first time in any particular journey. Again, one of the adab of seeing the Kaaba for the first time is trying to see it in its entirety. Uh, it can be very uh, difficult with the challenges of trying to walk in and so on and so forth. But if you are going with a group, it is kind of manageable because you'll have someone in front of you and they just tell everyone to kind of, hey guys, just keep your gaze down. And then eventually get to a point where you'll be able to see the entire Kaaba, may step to a side, be able to see it. When you see the Kaaba, you say, Allahu Akbar. Right? We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mention the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say Allahu Akbar. And then in that moment, you make dua. Right? You make dua. Raise your hands and make dua. It should be a, a heartfelt dua. Take your time in making that dua. It is a moment in which, it's a moment that just cannot be described in words, to say the least. But, but know that in your journey, there's a few places where your du'as are accepted. All your du'as are accepted, guaranteed. Guaranteed. The first side of the Kaaba is one of them. But you have to have yaqeen. You have to have conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Your tawaf begins at the black stone. Okay, I'm going to kind of use this corner of this table, assuming that this is kind of sort of the black stone. Black stones in the Kaaba, there's green lights on the wall uh, that'll indicate where the black stone is. As you walk further across, you have the door of the Kaaba. In front of it, you have the Maqam Ibrahim. Okay, so your tawaf sort of begins at the black stone. Um, and then as you walk around, you have the half enclosed circle that is known as the Hatim. Uh, the Hatim for many years was actually closed. People couldn't get in, but the Hatim does open up a few times a day for people to be able to get in these days. Uh, I, I, I wasn't even trying one day after Fajr. I just happened to get in somehow. And be a little patient. Don't be in a real hurry. Okay, with any, any, there's a lot of rush. Um, but, you know, I was able to get inside the Hatim. If you're, the, the area inside the Hatim, the semicircular wall, is considered to be a portion of the Kaaba, which means that if you get inside the Hatim, it's as if you're inside the Kaaba. And if you're inside the Kaaba, whatever dua you make is an accepted dua. Now, if you can't get inside the Hatim, you don't have to push, you don't have to regret, you don't have to fight, you're in the Kaaba. It's all sacred. Not, not, not just the masjid, the city is sacred. So you could be in your hotels. While you're in your hotels, don't be wasting your time on your TikTok videos. Right? You could be in your hotels, use that as a time of, it's not just the haram, the masjid that is sacred. You're within the sacred precinct. It's all sacred. Right? So keep that, that should be our perspective as well. Okay, uh, beginning the umrah. Beginning the umrah, you come around to the black stone. The brothers, there's two things that we have to do in our tawaf. The first one is we have to expose our right shoulder when we're making all seven circuits and only seven circuits. So if you have your ihram around you like this, you simply let it down. 
and you pull it through underneath your right armpit so your right shoulder gets exposed. That will happen for all seven circuits. And then you will, you're, we're supposed to walk like a brave warrior in the first three circuits. Any tawaf which is followed by a sa'i from Safa to Marwa, you make, uh, you walk like a brave warrior in the first three circuits. Can be a little tough with the amount of people there, but inshallah somehow manageable to the best of your ability. You'll have scholars with you so they'll guide you inshallah. You get to the black stone, you stand in line with the black stone anywhere, anywhere inside the haram. It could be on the first floor, second floor, roof, wherever it is. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. That's how you begin your, so when you begin your salah, you say Allahu Akbar. In the case of tawaf, you say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Then you have to kiss the black stone. You kiss the black stone at the beginning of every circuit and at the end of the last. So a total of eight times. Best way to kiss the black stone, istilam is the Arabic word, palms facing out. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Kiss and you begin your tawaf. So two things to begin your tawaf. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. And kiss. Now you begin your tawaf. As you begin your tawaf, the sunnah of the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam is that from the black stone all the way until you pass the door of the Kaaba, you say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. From there onwards, all the way around, you can say what you want. Recite any dua, recite Quran, dua in Arabic, dua in English, dua in your own language, dua for dunya, dua for akhira. The last thing you should be doing is doing selfies, pictures, FaceTiming, etc. You're in ibadah, you're in worship. Put that into perspective. Um, as you come around, the corner which is right before the black stone is known as Rukun Yamani. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, if he was, and he was close to the Kaaba, he would touch it with both hands or with his right hand only. That's not possible with the amount of people. You'll be far away. Don't do anything. You'll see some people waving at it. Don't wave. There's no waving. You simply walk by. Unless you're touching it, you're not doing anything. You're simply walking by. But from the Rukan Yamani, all the way back to the black stone, it's sunnah to say, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al All the way from Rukan Yamani, all the way to the black stone. You come to the black stone, you face the black stone, you have to kiss the black stone. You kiss the black stone, palms facing out, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar, kiss. Circuit number one done. And then, رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَ عَذَابَ النَّارِ All the way to the door of the Kaaba. And then from there onwards, any dhikr that you want to make, all the way until Rukan Yamani. When you get to Rukan Yamani, you won't do anything because you're not close to the Kaaba. رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَ عَذَابَ النَّارِ All the way. Keep on reciting it as many times as you can until you get to the black stone. Second circuit done. Beginning of the third one. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Kiss. رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً All the way until the door of the Kaaba, and then, so you'll continue. Similarly, you'll finish seven circuits. At the end of the last, you stand again in line with the black stone. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Okay. Done. Seven circuits, done. Okay. Now, you need to go and make Sa'i from Safa to Marwa. But before you go and make Sa'i, there's a few things that you need to do. You need to pray two rak'ahs. Two rak'ahs. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was to pray those two rak'ahs behind Maqam Ibrahim. Immediately behind Maqam Ibrahim, you're causing yourself an inconvenience, you're causing an inconvenience to everyone that's making tawaf. Go back by about a hundred feet, there's enough room there, you can pray your two rak'ahs there. If you're going as a group, generally I like to recommend to not even go behind Maqam Ibrahim, just go for, keep, on, keep going on your tawaf and kind of go a little further out on that end. It's a lot of room there. The group can come together and pray your two rak'ahs. Raise your hands and make dua. It's all, this entire journey is about dua. This entire journey is about asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, the sunnah of the Prophet wasalam, was to drink zamzam water. There's a very specific dua that is preferred to, to recite when we drink zamzam. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilman nafi'a wa rizqan wasi'a wa shifa'am min kulli da. And then you will go, so you're done with that. You can breathe, you can relax, you can sit for a few minutes, there's no hurry. By the way, during the seven circuits, at any point if you're tired and you wanna sit down, you can sit down. During the seven circuits, let's just, I'm just saying this to put things in. If you're hungry, assume someone's hungry, like on their third circuit all of a sudden, and has this ardent desire to 
get a shawarma. And they left and ate and came back. The tawaf is still valid. You don't have to start over. Just for the record. Okay, I, I just, no one does that. Don't do that. But I'm just explaining that that's, so there's no specific rules per se around that. Wudu is a requirement for tawaf. If you break your wudu in your first, second, third, or fourth circuit, you have to start over from number one. If you break your wudu in the fifth, sixth, or seventh circuit, you make wudu, you come back, and you start from where you left off. Okay, majority versus. So if you break your wudu in circuit one, two, three, or four, make wudu, start over with number one. If you break your wudu in five, six, or seven, make wudu, come back, and uh, continue from where you left off. You prayed your two rak'ahs, you drank your zamzam, now you make your way to Safa and Marwa. This is a nice walkway. Tawaf is generally easy. Safa and Marwa is a long walk. So for those of you that may have issues with your legs or the bottom of your feet or heels or whatever it is, uh, make sure that you if, you, if you must wear footwear during the Tawaf or during the Sa'i, it's allowed. It's completely allowed. Uh, just make sure out of adab, to carry an extra clean pair of footwear with you that you only wear inside the haram and you don't wear it outside, just out of the sanctity of the haram. The walk between Safa and Marwa is a long one. So if you have issues with the bottom of your feet or your heels, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's, it, can, uh, it can take a little toll on you. But all in the love of Allah, all in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'd rather be able to make sa'i and get calluses on my feet than not and get no calluses on my feet, as painful as they are, if you know what I'm saying. Right? And may Allah protect us all from all forms of diseases and difficulties and worries. I mean, Ya Rabbul Alameen. But Rizbai did say something earlier. It was all about perspective. Right? Two people will travel on the same journey on the way there, on the way back. We'll go through everything together, but we'll have two completely different experiences. And it's all about your attitude, as Parviz Bhai said. It's all about perspective. If I have time, I'll share you a story just from last week, but not yet. You get to Safa. There's really nothing to be done. You say, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar. If you know the verse, Inna Safa wal Marwata min Sha'a, you recite it. But other than that, there's nothing to be done. You begin your journey towards Marwa. There's an area closer to Safa with the green lights. Hajrah radiallahu anha jogged, ran as she was searching for water. The sisters will not run, jog, because you're in the presence of men, so you simply keep walking. The brothers, to the best of you, some people sprint. Hajra didn't sprint. Hajra just kind of ran because it was a valley. And so as she was going into the valley, she just came in. And so you just kind of jog a little. As the green light area ends, you continue your walk towards Marwa. When you arrive at Marwa, every time from there onwards that you arrive at Marwa and Safa, Marwa and Safa, Marwa, it's a time to make dua. The Prophet ﷺ made dua. Raise your hands for a brief minute. Ask Allah for something. The most powerful dua in the world, most powerful dua of the Quran is Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. Allah grant us goodness in this life and the hereafter. Protect us from the fire of hell. If you don't have time to do anything, just recite that. You're asking Allah for all the goodness of this life, all the goodness of the hereafter, and protection from the fire of hell. What, what, more, what more can we ask Allah for? It only takes a few seconds. Safa to Marwa is one. Marwa to Safa is two. Safa to Marwa is three. Marwa to Safa is four. Safa to Marwa is five. Marwa to Safa is six. And Safa to Marwa is seven. So. Each, each trip is considered one. It's not a round trip that's considered one. Otherwise, you'll be doing it 14 times. Yes, it's only one, two, three. At that point, you're done. You need to come out of your ihram. The way to come out of your ihram is get a haircut. So brothers, the sunnah of the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam was to shave your head. Right? So you'll find barbers everywhere. If you have the strength and the ability uh, and you have no reason to not get your head shaved, get it shaved. The Prophet ﷺ made dua forgiveness three times for those people who had their head shaved. Once for the one who had their head, tr their hair trimmed, right? But the trim should be from the entire head and not just small portions here and there. I recently found out in some ethnic cultures that um, 
if you're not going for Hajj, like the first bald head that you should get should be at Hajj and should not be at Umrah. Yeah, some it's very, you know, culturally we got some really crazy things going on in our lives. And so I had a family that like, like, you know, just did not want to get their head shaved at all. Right? They were like, nope, we're saving our head shaved for Hajj. I said, okay, do what you got to do. Sisters. And this is what Pervez Bhai was reminding me of. It. Right, sisters. You're still in a haram. So the only way you can come out of a haram is get that haircut. Now, sisters, you just simply bunch your hair together. And it, they say you wrap it around your finger. And whatever it is, you just chop it off, cut it off, right? About an inch, so you just kind of get it together and just... But you can't cut your own hair, because you're in ihram. And don't ask another sister to do it for you, because she may also be in ihram. You cannot do it, that's right. Yes. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, I got an answer for you. Yeah, calm down. You know, there's usually, there's at least one couple that's with you somewhere. Or your husband has done his tawaf and he got his haircut. He will cut his wife's haircut. And then the sister who already has her haircut by her husband can open up a barber shop in her room. Okay. Uh, by the way, that's the other thing. You don't have to get your haircut immediately. Your haircut can happen after four or five hours. Let's assume you got your umrah done at four o'clock in the morning. Fajr is at five. You don't have to go and get your haircut immediately. You can wait until Fajr, pray Fajr, you can go have breakfast, and then you're like, okay, now let me... But of course, since you are in ihram, no washing hands with soap, you know, things, things of that nature. So there's all, you'll always find someone, another sister in the group or wherever, even if you're traveling alone, you'll find someone and say, hey, well, you know, or you knock, knock the door, knock the room next door, and you... Tell them, hey, is there a sister here who's not in a haram who can cut? No, you know, you'll figure it out. Don't worry. Take a chill pill. It's okay. It's just not the end of the world. So that is doing the haircut. Thank you for the slides and moving on. Okay, awesome. I need to move on. Okay, so you're out of a haram. What do you do in Makkah? By the way, in the haram in Makkah, there's no tahiyyatul masjid. The tahiyyah of the haram is tawaf. So you go in if you can. You don't have to put on an ihram for that. You just, you're wearing your regular clothes. You walk inside the haram. In wudu, of course, you get in line with the black stone. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Kiss and seven circuits around the Kaaba. Rabbana atina till the door of the Kaaba. Any dua all the way until Rukan Yamani. From the Rukan Yamani all the way to the black stone. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Kiss the black stone. Seven circuits. Pray two rakahs. You're done. If in the middle of those seven circuits, the adhan is called, you continue your tawaf. In the middle of those seven circuits, prayer happens. You just stop, do your prayer, and continue from there. There's no, there's no rules around it. You know what I'm saying? But you should try to make tawaf at least one set of tawaf. One, one tawaf is seven circuits. Try to do one tawaf at least per day. Someone wants to do another umrah. You want to do another umrah. Then you put on your ihram or your ihram clothing in your hotel. This is the easiest way to do it. Then you go downstairs, outside, and you find a taxi. The taxi, you tell them Masjid Aisha. You want a return trip from Masjid Aisha. You go to Masjid Aisha, you pray two rak'ahs. That's sunnah, not a requirement. And then you make the intention for Umrah. You say labbaik, you come back to the haram, and you make seven circuits around the Kaaba, sa'if, seven times, haircut, and you've done your second Umrah. Now, the most common question I get is, can I make an umrah for a relative of mine or tawaf for a relative of mine who has passed away? Yes, you can. Can I make an umrah or tawaf for someone who is alive? Yes, you can. Absolutely. Can I combine multiple people in one umrah or one tawaf? Generally, you make one tawaf for a person, one umrah for a person. But if you did not have the ability to perform multiple tawafs or umrahs for whatever reason, and you combined a few people in your umrah, inshallah, they will all get the sawab of it as well, inshallah. That is the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But generally, you do one uh, per person. Recite as much Quran as you can. I was just with a young boy this morning. 
at 10 o'clock, whose family planned it such that he finished his first tilawat of the Quran in the haram. A few years ago, I was in the haram where a young man, in 2018, Thanksgiving 2018, a young boy at the age of 17 at the time had his last lesson, his last sabaq of memorizing the Quran in the mataf. So you, all of you have one month. Start your Quran recitation now. So that when you get there, either in Mecca or Medina, where, wherever and whenever is convenient for you, you can make your khatam of the Quran and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So again, this journey is about ibadah and worship. Okay, thank you Munir, thank you. Women, if you are menstruating, can you enter into the state of ihram? Yes, you can. The long and short of this entire mas'ala and this stipulation is that you must enter ihram when you pass the miqat. That's a requirement. Purity is not a requirement for entering into ihram. The two rak'ahs that you pray before the ihram is a sunnah, is not a requirement. Okay? So you enter into ihram. You cannot enter the haram until you are pure to make your tawaf and your sa'i. So you have to wait until you're pure to make your tawaf and your sa'i. Assuming that all the days that you're going to be in Mecca, you're not going to become pure. What do you do? In the state of hayz, in the state of menstruation, on your period, you go inside the haram, you make seven circuits around the Kaaba, you go from Safa to Marwa, complete your Umrah, get your haircut, and give the dumb of one goat. Not a large animal, a small animal. The large animal is a requirement in Hajj, that's, we're not there. So just keep that in mind. I'm, uh, this is the long and short of the, the entire Mas'ala and stipulation. Yeah, it's almost impossible. People going, you know, people going for three, four days. How do you manage? You know, it's, it's difficult. Not everyone can get on pills. It's just, you know, it's a, that, that's why I said the long and short of all of this. Okay. Ziyarah of the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina Munawwara. Before you go, you're, do two things. For a moment, just sit in your hotel room, on the bus, wherever you are, and contemplate. Where am I going? Who am I about to meet? Who am I going to give salam to? And I could go on forever, but just salawat on the Nabi As you're walking to the haram, give sadaqah. That's from the sunnah. Give sadaqah. The best people to give sadaqah to are the cleaners. You know, just people in the heart. Give some sadaqah. You end, for salam, for the brothers, it can be done all throughout the day. You enter through Babu Salam. By the way, you don't enter straight into Babu Salam anymore. You have to go all the way out and about and around and into these fenced areas. And then you will enter Babu Salam. Just for the record, for those of you that have not been there in a few years. Babu Salam, all the way through. You walk all the way till the end. You will come to the area where... There's three grills, one metal, one, two, and three. The middle one is where the Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and Umar radiallahu an are. You give your, and they, the qibla is behind you, so the Nabi alayhi salatu was salam is resting here, facing the qibla, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu an is one step behind him, again facing the qibla. And Umar radiallahu anhu is one step behind him facing the Qibla. So when we are giving our salam, we first give our salam to the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do it with your heart. Do it with your mind present. Don't be rattling. At least the first time you go, don't be rattling off names of a phone. This is your personal salam to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Salamu alayka ya Amir al -Mu There's no specific words. O oh, Amir al muminin Right? My salam to you. Assalamu alaykum. And then same to Umar radiallahu anhu, and then you will walk away. The sisters do not have access to this area. The sisters will be in the back area. Generally, we have found our teachers telling us, reminding us, that at the very least, without any difference of opinion whatsoever, that from inside the haram anywhere in Medina, you can give your salam to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as Parvez Bhai was mentioning and reminding a few moments ago that reading off all your friends' names and the lists of people, from anywhere inside the haram, give your salam. Though, for some people, there's a certain 
sukun, uh, satisfaction in when they can't spend so much time on the inside to do it from the outside where they can see the green dome, right? Because there's a certain, we have a certain connection with the Nabi alayhi salatu was salam and the green Ottoman dome. We have, so standing there and you can give your salam from there as well. There's no harm in doing so. Um, women, your times are different than the men for going inside the rawdah. Uh, just again, very quick logistics. Uh, in the front of the mosque, and for, you're staying at the Pullman, so it's really convenient for you. So you'll just come straight from the Pullman, and uh, there's just lines. Uh, everyone will line up. There's multiple lines. It makes no difference which line you get in. And then there's a askari, there's an uh, officer who will come and check your phones to make sure your apps are flashing. They have to be flashing. And then you go inside and you get seated in one of six areas. This is all outside. So again, if you're going at night, if your appointments are night, it's going to be chilly. So make sure you got your beanies and your jackets with you, your shawls or whatever it is, socks, whatever. You'll be seated outside in large areas. And then one by one, each group gets to go inside to give inside the rawda. And you actually don't, last year you would go in from uh, Bab Abu Bakr, which is in line with uh, Babu Salam. They've changed it now. You're actually going from the back, uh, Babu Nisa, you're entering inside and then you're walking towards the Rawdah. So you'll figure this out. They're very kind. Remember, it's, it is in their best interest to facilitate this Umrah, this Salam, everything for you. Be nice to people, give your Sadaqah, Make dua, Allah will make that journey easy for you. Very simple. When you get inside the rawdah, don't be in a real hurry. Just calm down. Just find some presence of heart and mind. Right? And then find a space. And make. I tell you, the, 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 one, one thing that has worked, that worked for me, I can't say it works for everyone, I, did not, I didn't start my prayers immediately. I just stood. Because I was in Jannah at that point. And one of the things, one of the adab of getting inside the rawdah, if you do, is making dua to Allah and say, Ya Allah, you have promised that once someone enters paradise, you don't kick anyone out. I've entered paradise, you can't kick me out from here. It's a dua. It's, it's from the, you know, the ulama mentioned this. And so I waited. I just stood and made dua. And then I, you know, daddy long legs, I started jumping over people as they were praying to find the empty spot. And before you know it, I was standing in the first row of the rawdah right next to the resting place of the Nabi So a little bit of patience, a little bit of sadaqah, a little bit of kindness, gratitude, right? There's people who will sit there and complain about how the Saudis manage things. And then there's people who will sit there and say, oh, I'm just grateful I'm here. Be the second. Okay, my time is up, so I'm going to uh, move on. As salatu was salamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Very simple. Praying inside the haram in Mecca. Your fard prayers in Mecca should be inside the haram. Each prayer is equivalent in sawab, in reward, to 100,000 prayers. Now, some people are thinking, does this mean that 100,000 prayers that I owe are made up? No, 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 no. You get the sawab, inshallah. Ask Allah for ease. In the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's narrations of 1,000, 5,000, and 50,000. So your fard salawat should be inside the haram. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say. Again, many of you will have your teachers with you and so on and so forth. The mazarat, in the, the, the sightseeing, as we may call it, in Mecca, in Medina, uh, Masjid Quba, first masjid ever built in Islam, Masjid Qiblatain, where the Qibla was changed, the battle, the site of the battle of Uhud, if you're going by yourself and you're not going with a group, read a little about it before you go. So that when you get there, you can feel the presence. You can feel, at least you know what happened. It's not just a place where you came to take pictures and check in to your social media sites and say, I'm here. You know what I'm saying? Like hashtag Masjid Quba, hashtag first Masjid in Islam, hashtag your brother is present, hashtag, you know, we're not there for hashtags. Right? Like, what was this really all about? And then, of course, leaving Medina with some level of sorrow, of separation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make it easy for all of us.
Um, I'll take, do I have time for questions for by about five, seven minutes, inshallah? Okay. I just want to share one thing. Um, when, 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 um, when people these days in this modern land go for Umrah, they send out like a message. Here's a Google Doc, send me your du'as so I can read them. There's no tradition of that. Like, if anyone would have thought of that, our pious predecessors generations ago would have thought of that and would have left a notebook outside their masjid, the biggest scholars, and said, I'm going for Umrah, write down your du'as. No, that's not how it works. So if you're going to do that, don't. The adab is that the seeker should go to the one. I will go to Asif Bhai. Say, Asif Bhai, I'll, I'll call him. I'll send him a message and say, Asif Bhai, I know you're going for Umrah. Make du'a for me. Then he puts my... But for Asif Bhai to send out an email and say, now Asif Bhai can send out an email and say, I'm going for Umrah. That's fine. Please forgive me. Remember me, etc., etc. But Asif Bhai is not going to send out a Google. I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot like this. <laughs> Asif, and by the way, Parvez Bhai talked about the first Hajj where he met Asif Bhai. Actually, I was on that Hajj too. So that's where we all met. That's where we first got to know each other. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, Asif Bhai is not going to send out a link to a Google Doc and say, I'm going for Umrah. Send me your du'as. That's not the way to do it. People ask you to make dua, you write their name down, you definitely make dua for them. Make dua for yourselves, for the dunya, for the akhirah, for your children, for your progenies that you will never see. You know, for everything, for your siha, for your health, for your wealth, just everything. Right? Put it all together. And again, duas from the hadith in accepted whispers will help you put together what kind of a dua you should be making for yourself. Right? What kind of it? Sometimes we don't even know what to ask Allah for. Or we run out of things to ask Allah for. Right? And so keeping that in mind. That's the end of what I have to say. I just want to share a story. Just a really quick story. I'm going to take your questions after this. Again, I was in Umrah last week. And um, we checked into our hotel in Medina. And, you know, some people opt for double rooms, triple rooms, quad, and things like that. So we had uh, two groups of individuals. Both had double rooms. Okay. Um, but... There were four beds in the room. Now, we weren't gonna, there was not four people in the room. There was only two people in the room, but there was four beds in each room. That's how the hotels had it set up. It was more convenient for them to give us whatever rooms they had immediately available. And so, so when I gave the key to one group of two, I said, hey, there's four beds in your room. In case you want the two beds removed, just let me know. Perspective. They said, eh, Imam Tahir. I'm in Medina. What am I going to complain about? Let the bed stay. And guess what? If the beds are there, I have place to put my luggage and my clothes. Perspective. Another group of two enter into their room, and I get a text message that says, this hotel is crappy. Uh, you've put us in dorms. Uh, perspective. Right? It's all about perspective. Right? So, I had a brother, a young man in Medina, who lost his luggage. I spent four hours with him that morning. We went to the... We went to the masjid together, we went to give our salam together, we prayed our duha together, we went to uh, the graveyard uh, baqir together, we came back for breakfast. He didn't mention anything. I found the bag and I sent a text message on the group and I said, whose bag is this? And so the young man responded back and said, hey, that's my bag. So when I met him again, I said, hey man, like you lost your bag. You were with me for four hours in the morning, you didn't even mention it. He goes, you know, I just lost a bag. What's the big deal? Right? I just lost a bag. But I, like, how, how could I be thinking about my bag? Well, thank you. Well, I'm here. Right? I just, so I got a text message two days ago that from the hotel rooms that we checked out at, I'm sorry, I got stories. Um, last one, last one, last one. I know. For, someone forgot their iPad. They didn't even care. They didn't even write to me and say, hey, Mom, I forgot my iPad. Is there any way to find it? They were just happy they got to go to Makkah and Medina. I'll just buy another iPad. Right? Perspectives. Perspectives. Sorry, I'm done. I'm going to try to keep my answers to a minimum. Questions. Yes. Yes, yes. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Thank you, Munir. Thank you, Professor Bhai. I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. What's the question? So the question is, I have to cover my face, right? But I can be covered with the mask or otherwise done with 
Okay, and the answer to your question, very simple. The question is, can I wear a face mask or not, considering that if I wear a face mask, it's, it's you know, I, the face must be exposed. Yeah. Um, f the first thing I want to say is stop watching all those videos. Okay. They'll make you confused. Yes. Secondly, during pandemic, if you have a face mask, you do not have to give it them. You don't have to give any penalty. If you feel, if you feel that you must wear a mask on your face, then so be it. Yes, second question. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about all that. And you don't touch uh, haram because it's just, just First of all, there's no trick to there's no requirement to get close to the Kaaba at any time. If you and, who doesn't want to get close to the Kaaba? Just don't do it during your tawaf. Because during your tawaf, you're busy with your tawaf. When you're, you have three, four days there. When you're done with your tawaf, you're back in your regular clothes. You're showered, you're rested. Then one fine day, go close to the Kaaba and touch the Kaaba. Make dua. There's no harm that re re resolves you of all your problems of being in ihram and so on and so forth. By the way, the best time to be in the mataf area is between like 8 and 10 in the morning. Just for the record, everyone's out at breakfast. Yes, question. No, no, it's just, I'm, I'm being logistic. Logistic. Someone just told me this morning that I told them to make their umrah at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they said it was very easy. We got done with the whole thing in, in, in an hour. Right? So again, now, it may not work for you. You may say, Imam Tahir was the worst thing that ever happened to me. I can't help you. But I will tell you, perspective, perspective, perspective. Sadaqa, sadaqa, sadaqa. Allah opens the doors of His divine mercy through these things. Yes. No problem. Yes. Uh, can you take your four year old child with you to Riyadh al Jannah on your permit? Yes, you can. Uh, the lines are all outside in the front of the haram, there's no gate. Good question. So when you are making your regular tawaf outside of your umrah, are you considered to be in the state of ihram? No, you're not. You're, you're not in ihram. You're simply making tawaf. So yes, you can touch the Kaaba and so on and so forth. Yes. Yeah, by the way, getting inside the rolda is a little tough in terms of the whole permitting, but they're kind of nice as well. Don't get me wrong. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's in their best interest to get people through. No, no, I understand, but like, you know, there's people who have sometimes been without a permit and they're with a wheelchair or a child doesn't have a permit or an elderly person doesn't have a permit. They'll, 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 they'll let you go through. Preparing your mind and heart for this journey, allowing yourself to realize where you're going and why you're going. And, and this, this, that you're going to the sacred house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We're going, as Muslims, we are going to the most sacred place on the face of this earth. And to be able to, you know, um, acknowledge that, to realize that, uh, that this is where I'm going. What do I need to do? I'm not, I, I can't start becoming a perfect, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to, when I get to Mecca, turn the switch on and get all my five prayers in all of a sudden. I need to start now, right? Showing our desire to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we go to Medina specifically, uh, we'll, we're, the entire mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the, uh, was about the size of the city of Medina. At any given time, anywhere inside the haram, you're probably going to be praying inside the house of a sahabi. And you don't even know this. Now, if it was all marked, we would be fighting for it. Right? So rightfully so, it's probably not marked. But again, you're probably praying inside the house of a Sahai. Like, we're in the, like, uh, you know, planning happened here. Revelation happened here. Right? The Nabi wasalam sat there. The Nabi wasalam walked those streets. The Nabi wasalam had happy moments, sad moments. In all, so that's the preparation. In a nutshell. We have a sister in the back. Go ahead.
Love the question. Most powerful question. Yes, we should make dua for the entire ummah as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Ya Allah, bring ease upon the entire ummah. And if you want to mention certain nationalities, groups specifically, then so be it. As far as making dua generally for people who have asked you to make dua, yes, absolutely. You know, Ya Allah, whoever has asked me to make the, the general, what we've learned from our teachers is they would say, Ya Allah, whoever asked me, whoever wrote to me, whoever desired to ask me to make dua that was not able to tell, ask me, or whoever it is that I should be making dua for because of what they owe me and I haven't been able to make dua for them, grant ease or even, you know, fulfill their, so multiple categories of individual. One last, okay, two last questions and then I'll close because I know you have other things. Yes. Qurbani.haramain.com Yeah, everything, there's an app for everything. Uh, I think that's the website, but the website is called haramain.com, H-A-R-A-M-A-I-N.com. There's a link to Qurbani there. The people that manage that entire um, website are people that I know. They're reliable, they're trustworthy, and they can care, take care of your dumb for you in Mecca. Dumb, by the way, Two things. Dumb must happen in Makkah. So you can't say I'm going to have a goat sacrificed in America or India or wherever. Okay, dumb for... Okay. Now, ju just because you made a mistake doesn't necessarily mean you owe a goat. Okay, so don't assume the worst. The goat, the penalty of a goat, the dumb of a goat is of the highest caliber by making a massive mistake, right? Something like, you know, uh, t t taking a shower and sh shampooing your entire head. Okay, so simply washing your hands with soap, that's five riyals. Okay, you decided to comb your hair, five riyals. You forgot and you took your, you're on your way to the haram and you're in your ihram and you feel like you're smelling and you pull out your cologne and you're like, Shh, you know what I'm saying? That's just five riyals. That's five or seven riyals. Yeah, so. Okay, last question. Yeah. By the way, you know, some people are like, I have to stand there, turn around, put my arm, like, I oh, ain't got time for that. There's a lot of people. No, 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 no. You, you could, okay, okay, watch, just watch. You could simply just do this. Bismillah, even with one hand. Just turn a little. Bismillah, Akbar, and keep walking. You're good. That's all. Even that is valid, just for the record. So you don't have to like formally turn around, put both of your arms out, hands out, arms out. The Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam would make istilam with his stick. Yeah, that's also from the sunnah. Of course, we can't do that. But yeah, if you're just simply making thought, you're like, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fila akhirata hasana wa qina adhab al nar. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fila. That's it. You just keep on going. You, you, you're, because you're in the mosque, you're generally barefoot. Yeah, but of course, if you choose to wear footwear, just make sure it's footwear for inside. Sisters, you have it easy. You could just simply buy thick socks, right? You could buy thick socks with like rubber uh, bottoms and you're good to go. Brothers, we're the ones that have it a little difficult, specifically during uh, Umrah. Other than that, you could be wearing your socks and making tawaf as well, so no harm done. I will, yes, young lady. Yeah. Or you can buy it from like Amazon or Etsy. Yeah, simple. Yeah, inshallah. I'm going to stop there. I know that I've, I've gone over my time, so I apologize. But jazakumullah khairan, barakallahu feekum. For all of you that are going, may Allah make your journey easy and blessed, inshallah. Please keep me and my family in your du'as, insha'Allah, and you will be in mind. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.